Hello, I am Steve Smith and welcome to the first in a series of four discussions post COP26 um, hosted by the Oxford Martin School. 88 days ago, on the 31st of October 2021, the city of Glasgow played host to what some termed literally the last chance saloon for action on climate change. Um, having been known as the second city of the British Empire and a global hub for shipbuilding, chemicals, engineering, Glasgow was for two weeks the global hub for negotiations on how to undo the high carbon legacy of industrialization and, ex and extraction. Now, of course, it wasn't really the last chance saloon, or perhaps we might say there have been several last chance saloons for climate and there will be more. Um, it was the 26th session of the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or COP26 for short. There have been 25 sessions since countries first got together to formally recognize the problem of climate change in 1992. And each session has been held in a different city across the world. And the 27th is, of course, planned for the end of this year in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. But behind the prosaic numbering and the, and the detailed international choreography, there is the very real urgency of the problem. Global temperature has now risen by a degree or more. Uh, the impacts of that rise have become very apparent, both in long-term environmental shifts and in jolting extremes. And governments have tightened the agreed temperature limit to well below two degrees and ideally one and a half degrees. And yet, global emissions have risen by 50% since the first COP, not fallen. And at current rates will exhaust the one and a half degree emissions budget in a mere decade or so. So alongside this rising sense of urgency, there was particular anticipation ahead of COP26 uh, for a few reasons, really. First, there were a number of threads to tie up around the landmark Paris Agreement, which was reached at COP21. That rule book for the oper operationalization of the Paris Agreement needed fixing. Uh, second, relatedly, it was when countries were expected to enhance their emissions pledges uh, in the first instance of the so-called ratchet mechanism set by the Paris Agreement. Third, it was the first time the UK had held the presidency of a COP. Internationally, that meant a, a climate progressive country with a large diplomatic resource at the helm, and hence a hope that maybe more could be achieved this year. And of course, domestically, that meant a COP on our doorstep and a very large engagement from Oxford people alongside other experts and activists across the UK. So with me today are some of those Oxford people, all of whom attended the COP, to help guide us through the outcomes of COP26, how close they bring us to success or failure and the way from here. Um, I'm delighted that I have with me Dr. Nicola Ranger. She's Deputy Director of the UK Centre for Greening Finance and Investment, and she's the Head of Climate and Environmental Analytics um, in the Oxford Sustainable Finance Group at the Smith School. Uh, Nicola can talk us through um, what went on in terms of climate change adaptation, dealing with the climate change that we are already facing and that we will face in the future, and also the role of finance. Uh, then we will have Professor Benito Muller. He's convener of the International Policy Research at the Environmental Change Institute. Uh, Benito can correct me if I'm wrong later on, but I suspect he's been involved in more COPs than anyone else in this university and has served as advisor for many groups on many topics throughout those years. In particular, he's worked to support the developing countries and build their capacity in the negotiations. So Benito will focus on the Paris rulebook and the process of international negotiation itself. Then we have Dr. Cécile Girardin. She's technical director of the Nature Based Solutions Initiative and science lead for the Oxford Biodiversity Network. Uh, not only is she a scientist uh, working on ecosystem function and carbon dynamics in forests, um, she's also an artist. So C Cecile was at COP painting a mural over the course of several days, right where delegates entered the venue. And uh, hopefully you've had the chance to see that amazing piece of artwork as the picture on the Oxford Martin School webpage for this event. And I think you can click on the link. You may see a green button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so Cecile will be talking to us about uh, what progress was made for nature at the COP, but I hope we'll get to hear a bit about her experience of painting there as well. And last but not least, we have Professor Miles Allen. He's director of the Oxford Martin Programme on the Post-Carbon Transition, and also uh, a colleague with me, a fellow director of the Oxford Net Zero Initiative. Uh, he's one of the most well-known climate scientists in the UK. He's contributed to several IPCC assessments, which of course form the 
the foundational evidence really for the UN negotiations. And special congratulations to Miles on receiving a CBE in the Queen's New Year's Honours list for services to climate change prediction, attribution and net zero. So uh, Miles will give us an overview of mitigation ambition. Are we on track to limit warming to the right level and perhaps in the right way? Uh, so I'm going to give each of these panellists five minutes to speak. Then hopefully we'll have around 20 minutes of discussion between the panellists, followed by questions from you in the audience. So you in the audience, please do submit your questions as we go along. Hopefully you can see an ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, do write your questions there. And I think you will have the chance to vote on questions of the popular. So I'll do my best to, to run through as many as we can, particularly the popular ones. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to each of our panelists to give five minutes on their thoughts. And I'd like to start with you, Nicola. Thank you very much, Stephen, and uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's good to, to be with you. Um, so let me start by saying a little bit about why I was in Glasgow, why, why I was lucky enough to be there, and, and also um, my thoughts on particularly the finance side of this, um, both the climate finance, but also how it links into broader finance and some of the commitments that we saw. So as, as Steve introduced, I'm the deputy director of a, a new national centre in the UK called the Centre for Greening Finance and Investment. And I was there at COP working with financial institutions, both private, but also public and central banks, um, trying to uh, support more dialogue in bringing climate into decision making in the financial sector. So we convened a number of events, um, and we saw a, a huge number of announcements um, from the financial sector, which I'll talk about. Um, I was also there launching a new, very exciting initiative called the, the Global Resilience Index Initiative. And I'll, I'll come back to um, the role of resilience uh, in a moment. But firstly, let me say a little bit about finance. So why, why is finance so important within the, the COP uh, discussions? So uh, as you may know, back in, in Paris, there was a commitment by countries to mobilise 100 billion a year um, by 2020 for um, emerging and developing economies, both for mitigation and adaptation. And the reason that that was so important was one, um, because these countries didn't create the problem, but are absolutely is an essential part of the solution. Um, and many of them will be the most vulnerable to climate change going forward. So this commitment to 100 billion um, is seen as an absolutely critical part of the negotiations. If, if we can't meet this, the, the, the trust between the high income world and the, the mid, lower middle income world will be seriously affected. And that will have quite a big political impact and, on our ability to succeed. So did we meet that uh, uh, in by 2020? Unfortunately not. We got close. So there's various different estimates, but uh, around the, the consensus, we got around to around 80 billion. So, you know, we're getting there, but but we're not there yet. And one of the big challenges, particularly that, that was put forward by um, uh, the most vulnerable countries, is that within that, the finance for adaptation, so the finance that is aiming to support countries to adapt to the impacts of climate change. And, and again, this is absolutely essential because many of these countries are, and, and actually countries all around the world, are already experiencing significant impacts. And that finance for adaptation, which notionally is expected to be about half of that 100 billion, is way too low. So research, for example, um, by IED recently showed that only about 10% of the finance that's being mobilized through these negotiations is actually reaching um, the poorest people um, to support them with adaptation. So we have a long way to go there, but there were some positive uh, outcomes on, on adaptation and resilience, um, including a, a, a process in place to establish a global goal for adaptation. Now that sounds like a very techie thing, but actually that's really important in terms of mobilizing action, um, as well as another a, a number of other processes. But other exciting things that we saw on finance. So this, I think one crucial thing in, that we need to remember is that these sound like big numbers, 100 billion a year. If you compare that to global financial flows, you know, it's tiny. And so what we also need to be doing is mobilizing the wider um, global financial system to align finance with where we need to be, both on net zero, but also resilience and nature as well. Uh, so there was also a lot happened at Glasgow uh, outside of the formal negotiations on that. So for example, we saw 
um, big financial institutions from around the world um, commit to aligning finance with a net zero target. Um, so this was a, a partnership called GFANS and committed. So the, these were financial institutions with um, combined assets of a, uh, well over 100 trillion. Um, committing to look over a number of years at how do you how can we align that finance to get finance to flow towards um, supporting net zero, um, and we can discuss uh, some of the challenges and opportunities in that maybe when we come to the discussion. But but one bit I and this is coming back to the announcement that we made on the Global Resilience Index. Something that we've been particularly looking at is how can we also make sure that that finance is actually supporting resilience and nature as well as net zero. Because at, at the moment, if you imagine, for example, global infrastructure investment, which is a really big driver of, of both our emissions, but also our resilience and our impact on the environment, is about 2.7 trillion a year. So, you know, that's nearly three times bigger than, than climate finance. So we need to be bringing resilience and thinking about nature and net zero into that. And one of the things that we launched at, at COP was an initiative with a number of different different partners across the public and private sector called the Global Resilience Index Initiative. And this is basically a set of metrics that allow financial institutions for the first time to really start to measure the impact that they're having on resilience. So I'll leave that as my opening uh, comments and, and look forward to discussing further. Thank you very much, Nicola. It's really helpful to have that 100 billion put into context. I know I've struggled to know whether that's a big number or a small number. Um, and it's interesting that finance touches not only on mitigation, so reducing emissions, also on adaptation and resilience. One of the other things I remember happened was uh, uh, there's also the issue of loss and damage. So the fact that there are some things that we won't mitigate, we won't adapt to. And Nicola Sturgeon, as head of uh, the Scottish government in a small but maybe symbolic gesture, uh, announced the government was giving two million pounds towards loss and damage. So that's another area where I think finance is going to rise up in the negotiations. Uh, but I'd like to pass to you, Benito, now. Um, Benito, perhaps you can confirm or deny whether you are the uh, Oxford University member who's been to the most COPs and tell us about the process of the negotiations themselves. Uh, <laughs> who knows? I've been, I've been in a few. But just to... I mean, I went to the COP the session in Glasgow, as usual. I mean, for me, if you want to influence something in the negotiations, you have to do it beforehand. Absolutely useless to go there and think that you can actually do, because all the positions are basically pre-cooked, pre okay? So I went for, to network, because that's important too, and it was a catastrophe. Way too many people. I mean, with masks, you, could, you, you didn't even see who you want to actually meet, <laughs> you know, sort of chance meeting in corridors. People knew me because of my hat. So that was something. But I mean, it was, I mean, for me, Glasgow itself was a washout, okay? But some good things happened. I mean, just to come to the finance flows, that, I mean, one thing, I've just written a submission, and one of the things is it's okay to have a numerical target, but we don't agree of how to count it. So to me, the whole 100 billion has always been uh, a recipe for mutually assured unhappiness, okay? <laughs> and one side will say, yes, we paid, the other, no, you didn't. And it's, so we need to actually become, uh, try to get more focused on what do we actually agree is climate finance? What do we agree is adaptation finance? And then look at the figures because otherwise it's not gonna happen. Now, personally, Oops, I was going to turn on my, my, my clock here, but never mind. I was interested in the rule book, the finalizing the rule book, but there were three three aspects which were had been going on for years, ever since Paris, and we could never come to a conclusion, and we did. And in terms of the actual the workings, the, the, the sort of the day-to-day -day working of the Paris Agreement, that was a major uh, outcome of Glasgow, okay? Actually an outcome of the COP. Article six, trading, transparency, and which is very important. How do we, since everything is bottom up now, we have to agree of how we report stuff, right? And then my hobby horse, I have to, to thank Cecile again for having a sort of uh, immortalized me on, on the mural with the common time frame, okay? Uh, 
people always thought, oh my God, this is just sort of uh, accounting. Well, it isn't. Let me just explain to you what it is. When we started with this whole regime, before Paris, parties started to communicate their intended NDCs, INDCs, and they just show, okay, fortunately, they did show multiples of five as the duration of these, of these targets, right? So we had a few did five, a few did five plus five, and a few did most of them, 80% did 10 years. So, Benito, these NDCs are nationally determined commitments. There are pledges of emissions reductions. or Well, emissions not, not only. Reductions. It's contributions. And, and uh, it was actually chosen to, uh, precisely not to having to, to talk about uh, targets. Okay. It, it, was, it was what do countries contribute to the process and, and things. And, and the five was, was a five yearly procedure for... Well, I mean, the, the, uh, I mean, if uh, the, the, if you have a 10-year horizon, you have a 2030 from 2020 is when to start. You have a 2030 pledge, if you wish, or whatever you want to do. And it was ve quite clear uh, very soon that having 10 years in between these targets is too long, too long for us to to be to look at more ambition, too long for us to to react to technology changes. Right, and, and which allow us to be more ambitious, but it was a struggle. I mean, it was really very tough to get eighty percent of the parties to turn around from ten years to five. Now we have five plus five, so we have. It's a. I mean, you know, as, as a former mathematician, I always thought that it's obvious what we should do: five plus five. But hey, it wasn't. <laughs> so what? What? What is? What is happening now is that basically in twenty twenty five. Parties will most part all parties will have a 2030 NDC. So they will announce 2035. When they when they reach 2030, they will announce 2040 and and hopefully uh, uh, enhance the 2035 one. Okay, so it's a sort of a rolling five year cycle, and it's it it is the best way which we can. I mean, the the main problem which I have had with with what what was there. This mixture of time frames, not synchronized end years and 10 years, was that it does it actually hinders ambition. You know, the least we can do with the process is, is make sure it doesn't. We cannot, the process cannot actually guarantee ambition. That's nationally determined, but at least you can help for parties to be as, as ambitious as possible. And the other thing is the global stock takes. We have the five yearly global stock takes. But with 10 year horizons, the, the, the middle one is useless, right? So now this is a, it's a good outcome, this one. And I'm quite happy about that. And I think we can now, I mean, the, the thing which we now have to focus on is that actually every five years, they are, they are expected to do better than what they thought they could do five years hence. That would be the idea. Thank you. Thank you, Benito. So we now have a much more organized, standardized, clear yeah. process for people coming from countries coming forward with pledges and then assessing them and hopefully ratcheting them up. Uh, I, I remember Benito reading that you'd written, you described COP26 as a roving village of about 5,000 people with an ever increasing number of tourists and that Glasgow is 30,000. So that gives, <laughs> gives listeners a, an idea yes. of the scale of the event. Um, Moving on to Cecile now. Cecile, what can you tell us about what was achieved uh, for nature at the COP? Thanks, Steve. And, um, and yeah, the, the tourist uh, comment is a perfect introduction because I was just going to say that before um, I get into the core business of what happened for the negotiations, um, I wanted to start by noting that a, a lot about what happened around the negotiations. So, so the, the discussions that came from the tourists, as you say, Benito. Um, so a lot of what happened for nature and biodiversity at COP was around the negotiations. The first week of COP, uh, we saw this flurry of big nature-related announcements with this uh, strong focus on halting deforestation and on shifting to more sustainable farming practices. Um, so just a few examples, because there there's a long list here, um, but there were about, so more than 100 countries accounting for, um, for approximately 90% of the world's forests, um, notably Brazil, Colombia, Indonesia, DRC, 
Um, these countries committed to end deforestation by 2030 in the Glasgow Leaders Forest Declaration. So that was quite a, a big outcome. Uh, then 45 governments representing 75% of global trade released this financial sector roadmap for in eliminating commodity-driven deforestation. And then there were various, as I say, a flurry of, of uh, commitments coming from the public and private sector, amounting to approximately $19 billion for nature and land use. And you can, um, so some of these were the Global Forest Finance Pledge. Some of them were bilateral partnerships that support indigenous and local communities. Um, there was a joint state statement to support the Congo Basin Forest, recognizing in particular the importance of peat bogs, of peat lands in, um, in the Congo forests. Um, the innovative finance for Amazon, Cerrado and Chaco for deforestation free soya and cattle and the list goes on. So all these big announcements were made. You can see them on the website of the Nature Based Solutions Initiative. We have a list that describes them in more detail. But all this demonstrated that the private sector are increasingly engaged, um, as you were saying, Nicola, uh, which is important given the, the need for private sector financing to achieve our global goals for biodiversity. And um, so all these commitments are great. And now we need to provide the mechanisms to ensure accountability, transparency, and how ensure that these commitments are implemented, monitored, regulated, etc. And in a socially just context. So when you listen to um, discussions around what happened at COP26, you hear the expression a lot, a just transition, not just a transition, which I thought is quite good. Um, but then to start addressing this, the International Sustainability Standards Board was launched at COP. So that's a, a, an international board that um, helps set global sustainability related disclosure standards and hopefully will bring all this, this work that's going on uh, together to call for high quality, transparent, reliable and comparable reporting from companies. So a lot of people were asking what's different this time because all these big announcements have been made before um, and we haven't necessarily seen the changes. I think the answers are this time there's more money being thrown at the at the problem. There's more pressure from civil society uh, for accountability. And also for businesses, there's a clear understanding and more quantification of the risks and opportunities associated with biodiversity loss in our case. Um, and then in terms of the core business of the negotiations, when it comes to the text of the Glasgow Climate Pact, we saw a few improvements from the, the Paris Agreement. So in terms of nature, we were quite happy to see that first it, it explicitly recognizes the connection between climate and nature agendas. So we simply can't separate these two issues. We could, um, for example, we could stay below 1.5, but still destroy all our biodiversity. And, um, and lose the biodiversity that underpins our life on Earth, really. So water, clean air, or food. Uh, so in the text specifically, it says recognize, recognizes the interlinked global climate, global crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss. And then it re recognizes the critical role of protecting, conserving and restoring ecosystem to deliver benefits both to adaptation and mitigation, which is important to us, of course, because it recognizes in like this, it recognizes the multiple benefits of ecosystems, not just as carbon stores. And the need to take uh, the multiple benefits as metrics of success of these projects. Um, and then later on under the mitigation, the text emphasizes the importance of forest and other terrestrial and marine ecosystems. So again, highlight and it goes on to highlight again the social and environmental safeguards, but we're very happy to see that it's, um, it's highlighting other ecosystems, terrestrial and marine, not just for a, for a strong focus on forest as it had before. So just in sum, it, the text supports that we're talking about projects that are ecologically sound, socially just, and net zero aligned. So the one thing I will finally add, and we can talk about that later in discussion if you want, um, 
is that we were quite disappointed that the term nature-based solutions was removed from the text. It was there um, in the first draft of the text. It was then removed. And the reason we're disappointed of, about that is that there are quite, um, there's been a lot of work done recently on uh, the definition of nature-based solutions, on setting standards and guidelines for nature-based solutions, on clear approaches to how to select and monitor these projects. And so having the term there would, would, um, would help in that respect. So taking the advice of Benito, we're already starting to prepare for COP27. And we are um, working on this, on clarifying the, the addressing the issues some countries may have with the term nature-based solutions, on clarifying the standards and the, and the guidelines. And we are working on um, a conference in July that will, that will look at all this. Thank you, Cecile. If I could jump in with a very quick question for you, actually. Do you know why nature-based solutions as a term was dropped from the text at the last minute? I mean, what, what's not to like about nature-based solutions? Yeah, uh, well, I think there were several reasons. Um, so the one I can probably talk the most about is the fact that um, there's, I think there's still a lot of confusion around what the natural climate solutions are, which are um, projects with a very strong focus on rapid carbon gains and nature-based solutions, which are projects that really uh, support, need the, to, to, to address the human well-being as well as biodiversity gains, as well as being net zero aligned. Um, so there's a lot of um, concern around uh, human rights, uh, non-ecologically sound projects, and um, and just land grab, really. Thank you very much. And thank you for giving us a whirlwind tour in one area where I think in particular, there were a huge number of announcements. And that was a feature of the COP, I think, that there was this blitz of announcements in, in all sorts of directions. And it was very hard, I think, for most people on the outside or even in the inside to work out what was important and what wasn't. So you flagging the fact that perhaps this time slightly different was the finance and the public pressure uh, it was very helpful and perhaps something we can pick up in the future com conversation about how how effective do we think these things are really going to be uh, going forward. Um, but first to Miles. Um, Miles, as someone who has played a key role in developing the concept of uh, the global emissions budget and the need for net zero emissions to stabilise climate change, um, how do you think uh, the COP did overall in getting us on the right path to actually stop climate change? Well, of course, the big news is that if people do what um, they say they're going to do in the commitments made prior to the COP, mostly, although India's commitment, I think, was made in the uh, early days of the COP itself, we've got 90 percent of the world's economy now committed to net zero emissions sometime between the 2040s and 2070, um, you know, Twelve years ago, uh, we published a paper where we said if, if we manage to save the trillionth ton of carbon or, or uh, limit the total amount of carbon we dump in the atmosphere to, to around a trillion tons, we, we had sort of even odds, at least, of keeping temperatures below two degrees. And if we do nothing more than keep emissions where they are to 2030, which is more or less what the NDCs suggest we will do, and then bring them down in a straight line to 2070, we will just save the trillionth ton. We'll keep it out of the atmosphere, which means that we then have roughly even odds of keeping global temperatures below two degrees. Now, of course, that's not enough, but it's a lot better than we might have expected us to be, you know, in 2009, when we published those papers and the whole process was falling to bits in Copenhagen and so on. So progress has been made. That said, of course, two degrees is no longer enough, and everybody is very much focused on how can we actually um, limit warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, and there, you know, it's not looking so good. The, the commitments that are out there are certainly not enough to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, or even limit warming to 1.5 degrees by 2100, which was a rather strange wording that appeared and then fortunately disappeared quite quickly from the uh, COP text. Um, so, so we've got um, a lot of work to do um, in term, but, but it, at the same time, it's important to recognize that the progress has been made in acknowledging what needs to be done, at least. And that's, you know, 
that, that's that's something. It's easy to get very downbeat about the whole thing. That said, having tried to be positive, um, I will also say that um, I found it um, disheartening at the COP about how little conversation there was about what I'm interested in. So I was definitely there as a tourist because I wanted to talk about something that it seemed not very many other people wanted to talk about at COP, which is how do we stop fossil fuels from causing global warming? Um, I found it depressing that the, the fraction of conversations at the COP that were about that were very small. Um, and um, one of the questions I think we do need to ask ourselves is have we allowed this process to get so amazingly complicated that we've lost touch with the basic point? We need to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming. If we don't stop fossil fuels from causing global warming, it frankly doesn't really matter what else we do. And this process has got so complicated that two of the major fossil fuels, oil and gas, weren't even mentioned at all. Yes, people finally brought themselves to mention coal and make some commitments on coal, and that's obviously a good thing. But in my view, oil and gas, they had a very good cop. They're doing very well, thank you very much. They're making phenomenal profits right now. And even the COP presidency is trying to work out how to start subsidizing fossil fuels again, as everybody starts talking about adjustment mechanisms for high fossil fuel prices and VAT relief on fuel bills and so on to protect hard, struggling families in the UK. These are basically fossil fuel subsidies we're talking about. So, you know, until we, in my view, simplify the process to make sure that at least some of it is devoted exclusively, laser focused on stopping fossil fuels from causing global warming, it's going to remain this sort of many tentacled beast that it doesn't, it's not terribly clear to me that it's actually solving the problem. And I welcome thoughts on, you know, it has the COP process become so complicated that actually the process whereby we stop fossil fuels from causing global warming will have to be something else entirely. It's, it's just, it's too difficult a problem that requires too much focus to be part of this big, many-layered, many-faceted discussion. Um, I don't know, um, but I'm, I'm not hopeful about the COP process actually delivering on this part of the agenda. Thank you, Miles. I think that question is a really important one about um, does the COP process need to change? Does the international negotiation process need to change? And if so, how? So I would love to come back to that one. Um, but first, I would just like to come back to you, Cecile, uh, because we mentioned that uh, you actually spent most of your time at the COP uh, painting and you were in a part of the venue uh, right by the cloakroom, I think, actually, where pretty much everyone who had access to the blue zone where the negotiations were happening. Um, was going past. So I think you perhaps had a slightly different perspective and perhaps met more people at the COP than many of us. So uh, with your artist hat on and your role there rather than your scientist hat, what was your experience of the COP? What were the kind of conversations that you had? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Steve. I, I never separate the scientist and the artist hats because it was it, the, it felt part of the same uh, job. Um, the um, Painting the mural was just an amazing, a dream come true. I, I could hardly believe it when we um, got the job. Uh, it was fantastic. We got given this two by five space, blank wall, and uh, and free reigns to do whatever we wanted with them. I must um, add that this was a collaborative project with my um, with my collaborator Lisa Curtis, who I work with a lot. She's a local um, a local artist in Oxford. And we couldn't have done it without the help of my son who came. Uh, he's 15 and he really got stuck in, interviewed people, worked so hard and, um, and was amazing at painting and writing. Most of the writing is, <laughs> is his. Um, and then thank you to Benito, Miles, Natalie, Sedan and Yadvinder who, who are now on the call. Uh, and, and the whole Oxford team for all the support and for really being out there and gathering and sending text messages and bringing the text together was a challenge, of course. It was quite nerve 
nerve wracking, nerve wracking. I don't know what the expression is. Um, but so the 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 um, idea of the mural was to not have a linear representation of time or or what we usually do have time and uh, targets that are. It was really to bring the chaos of COP negotiation um, to life, and so that's why we have lots of arrows and uh, the the people are represented there. You can recognize Benito um, with his hat, uh, talking about common time frames. Um, and then the, the, the notions of fossil fuels, biodiversity, etc. So we try to capture um, a lot. Um, Miles, I think one of my favorite part of the mural is the, the quote at the bottom right that says, keep carbon underground, what comes down must go back down. What comes up must go back down. <laughs> that, that was really good. Um, and then we, we captured all the big announcements that were coming in and the financing and the need for that financing to go to the right communities. So um, direct access to financing from the communities who need it. And in terms of, yes, as you say, we just saw hundreds of people come by every day and, and uh, contribute. Um, some of them were quite insistent on what they wanted to see on the mural. So there was a lot of plugging for, for projects in there. So we had to be uh, quite firm. Um, and then, but most for the most part, it was just lovely to see all the support and the enthusiasm and have great discussions. And one of the moments that was the most poignant was the, um, the head of the adaptation fund came and he just, um, he was very moved by it and he loved it. And because it says adaptation fund right in the middle. <laughs> Um, so it was, it was great. And afterwards, the UNFCCC wanted to take it back to Bonn, but in the end, um, it stayed in Glasgow and it's now, um, it's now in a civil society center in Glasgow. Excellent. I hadn't appreciated people would have strong views, but yes, round of applause to you. Maybe it was a sort of microcosm of the negotiations going on over your mural while the main negotiations were going on down the hallway. Um, <laughs> I'd love to get um, some of your reactions to other tours, but maybe I can kick off by just um, putting to Benito the, the point or the suggestion made by Miles. Ha has this negotiation process become too big, uh, too complex? If if you could make it more of... I did. Yes. I, think, I, think, I think we got the question. <laughs> if you could make it simpler, how would yes. you do it? <laughs> if I could make it more dot, dot, dot. Well, the one thing which, which I think we, uh, we need to remember is there are negotiations which so far, the last 15, 20 years, we have constantly negotiated treaties. You know, there was the Kyoto Protocol and then the, we, we'd had, we were going to have the Copenhagen Protocol, didn't happen, and then the Paris. We are now hopefully in a different mode. We know, I mean, please don't start another treaty negotiation, okay? Now it's actually implementation. That should be boring. We should not need headline outcomes, okay? We, we just have to keep track and, and the stock take and all that bureaucratic stuff, which is absolutely essential for us to know where we are, where we should be. So in my mind, we, we do need the circus, as I call it. The politicians who come and announce stuff, make all this, but not together, please. It, it's really, it is, it is few. So in my mind, I mean, there, there's this one thing which went wrong a little bit, is that we had these the, the, the whole bit with all the, the, the heads of state and government coming to the same location as the negotiations went on. It's just futile. And I tell you why, particularly for smaller countries, the moment your head of government or head of state is with you, everything else stops. <laughs> so the, the first week was basically, the first half of the first week was taken up by babysitting these guys, okay? And so that's just, it, it's no longer uh, useful. The, the, these events still have to happen. In my mind, they could happen annually, say in Geneva or somewhere, New York, right? Where all this political razzmatazz happens and, and, and the trade fair, it, it has become a trade fair basically, okay? And it is not necessarily indeed counterproductive for that to be in conjunction with the actual negotiations. So that, that would be my my take in terms of what we could do uh, is to separate the two. Apologies for dropping off there. Yeah. It seems my laptop overheated and decided to go to sleep. And I, it may happen again. I hope it doesn't. 
Uh, but thanks for holding that. Uh, Miles, did you want to come back on that point? Well, I just want to press on, on the negotiations themselves. I mean, yes, the environment in which the negotiations happen has become um, incredibly complicated. And, and, and but, but, you know, we've allowed lots and lots of agenda items to get added to the COP agenda. And we can make, and maybe it's because we can make progress on those ones while not making progress on stopping fossil fuels from causing global warming. But, but the problem is, that allows you to have to give it and maybe that's a good thing it allows you to say well at least we're still making some progress on climate change but it also allows you to divert attention from the fact that we're not making progress on the main point um and we're not making progress on the main point there's no point in sugaring the pill emissions are still going up they've bounced back very rapidly from covid um and and you know it's you know all the time and and, and indeed the fossil fuel industry is making almost record profits um so so you know, it, it's it, it does raise the question of whether we've whether we've really helped by allowing this process to become so multifaceted uh, and 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 perhaps lost track of. I, I didn't hear anybody at COP, any of the big cheeses, stand up and say we have to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming. Why not? Um, Benito, come back, and then I'd love to hear your thoughts, Nicola, about this from an adaptation perspective, actually, because I think we talk about this a lot in terms of reducing emissions. But Benito. I think we need to sort of scale down our, our expectations of what the multilateral process can actually deliver. Okay, The multilateral process, per se, can deliver, deliver a regulatory scheme, but it cannot deliver ambition in any facet. That's not... Well, particularly in a, in a process which is so bottom up as the Paris process has become. Okay. And in that context, if there is no political will amongst the big wicks, it's just not going to happen. But that, that is not the fault of the multilateral process. That is the fault of the governments of the world not taking it sufficiently seriously. Nicola, so we've talked a lot from an emissions reduction perspective. Do you think that uh, the multilateral process as it stands is beneficial in terms of aiding countries with dealing with the climate change that is already happening? Or, or do you think it needs sig significant revision on that front as well? Well, one thing I would say is that the multilateral process isn't just COP. So COP is a very narrow part of the multilateral process. And I be strongly believe that the multilateral process is absolutely essential um, to, to achieving what we need to achieve. And that's because this is, this is a problem that we all have to work together. And so we need, it's a problem of um, one part of the world having an impact on another part of the world and, and that needing to be fixed. It's a sort of classic externality problem and a global public good problem and so we can't it cannot if it goes outside of the big multilateral process then then we will fail um i i was I actually spent the last two days at a wilton park conference talking talking to particularly development professionals in, including those um that will be involved in cop 27 in in shaping that about you know where, where we are and, and where we need to be and a key message was we all win this or we all lose this it cannot be a bilateral thing so so just to emphasize you so in terms of the cop process itself um so this this was actually the first cop that i went to since copenhagen so after copenhagen i was one of those that became totally disaffected with the process and said you know i actually i just want to focus on the ground at making you know supporting countries on the ground and really making this work so you know this I sort of came back and was pleasantly surprised in, in some ways at the progress. But I think you know, progress has been made in that COP process. And we, we've talked to, uh, about a number of examples. But we have to remember that there is there's there's COP is the COP process is one part of the bigger multilateral process. And then you have the real world. And the real world is doing a lot. <laughs> and I would say, and a, a lot of good things, but also a lot of bad things. And I completely agree with the points that, that Miles has made. And I'll just throw in another one I'll, and I'll come to adaptation in a moment, I, I promise. But some research that has been done in the Smith School at Oxford in the economic recovery program, for example, looking at how much of all of the finance, all of the uh, trillions, so you know, more than 17 trillion of finance that's gone into COVID recovery, how much of that is actually green? And, and it's about 2%. So, you know, we, we are failing 
at the moment to really integrate um, net zero, nature, resilience, sustainability into our core processes globally. So there's there's a lot more to do. But on the positive, I'd say there's a lot of very good things happening. So I, I would say that some of the success that we've seen at COP um, this time around has be, has built on a number of things that have happened in the real world. A huge reduction in the costs of renewables, massive deployment of renewables. And, and I completely agree with it's not there yet. And I think it's absolutely critical that we haven't even peaked yet our emissions, let alone started to bring them down. Um, but then we have seen massive progress in a number of areas. So there's so there are good and bad things. And I completely agree with Miles that we need to be tackling those 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 things that aren't going in the right directions and the fossil fuel subsidies being a big one. You know, at COP we saw a, a commitment to end inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. I'd love to see what an efficient fossil fuel subsidy is, but you know, six hundred million a year. One that secures votes in the northeast. Oh, okay. <laughs> six hundred million a year is going into uh, fossil fuel subsidies. So you know, th this is you know, is enormous. So. Uh, but anyway, coming back to the adaptation point, so one, one of the key the key challenges that we hear is, you know, finance for adaptation in the COP process isn't enough. And there's a lot of discussion in the COP process that actually adaptation is really hard. You know, there's not enough projects. Developing countries don't have the capacity to do this. And I must say, that, you know, from working on the ground in um, low and middle income countries for the last eight years, that is just not the case. You know, when you work in countries they completely get it. They they understand this is their top priority because this is their livelihood. This is about building resilience. They don't even necessarily think about it in terms of climate change adaptation. This is about building the resilience and growth and prosperity of their societies. And they get it and, and there's capacity there to do it. And I think we have this disconnect um, between the finance flows. And a lot of that, you know, coming from the discussions where I was the last two days is a failure of delivery me mechanisms. Um, so the delivery mechanisms that we've set up as part of these big international processes are not working. You know, it took the, the Green Climate Fund three years before it even um, deployed uh, one dollar. And it's still not not <laughs> deploying most of the funding that sat in there at the moment waiting to be deployed. So, you know, there, there's a real failure in, in some of the architecture that we're setting up. But actually, again, outside of that process, the multilateral system is working so you know we saw this year a record replenishment of ida so ida is the part of the world bank that focuses on the poorest countries um over over 90 billion replenishment of ida um more than 50 percent of of their um, climate finance is going to adaptation in the world bank so we're seeing actually out you know in the real world a lot is happening uh, and so it's i think the key the, the key thing is to uh connect uh, connect though somehow that that and i completely agree overly complex process to actually the real world things and one of the things we heard from um the incoming cop 2017 today is uh you know now is the time to stop talking and implement and i and i think that's what we need to think about and the final point i would make is uh the uk's presidency lasts the whole of this year so it didn't end at COP26. And, and so assuming that a lot of our audience will be Brits, we need our government to be continuing to deliver against the commitments that it made at COP26 and continuing that process of dialogue to COP27. And um, we need that to continue to happen. And, and if to deliver on those huge commitments that were made and those big initiatives and to keep the dialogue going with, with countries. And I'll end it there. Thank you, Nicola. Um, I see Benito and Cecile want to both come in on that. So I, I will let you, but I'll also give you forewarning about a question I want to ask, which is, I think you, you explained really nicely, Nicola, that there are a lot of things that go on that are really important for climate, which aren't directly a part of the COP process. So I want to ask you about the, 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 the broader trends you see at play, be they national politics or whatever, that aren't necessarily climate trends, but you think will have a, a strong bearing on, on the next 12 months or so of, of climate action. But first, Cecile, then Benito, did you want to come back to Nicola? 
Yeah, it was just a really quick question to uh, to Nicola and Benito, I guess. Um, the uh, what what are the milestones then for the COP twenty on the route to COP twenty seven for the UK presidency that we could um, that we could feed into? So who? <laughs> Well, the, the, well the Benito, do you want to, you can come back to that briefly and ask your question and then... Yes, it, was, it wasn't a question, it was a, it was a, a remark. I mean, I'm always getting a bit uneasy if we're talking about the real world and the rest, okay? Because it usually puts me in the rest. <laughs> but even I am now branching out to the real world, if that's the private sector, because one thing which we need to do in terms of adaptation finance adaptation funding going through the multilateral channels is to try to mobilize private sector adaptation funding okay and one thing which i'm very concretely involved we just started that is for example to have the, the idea of the share of proceeds some of what you will know in the in the voluntary carbon market i mean we have it in we have it in the paris agreement but we can we can we can share this out to other carbon markets and emission trading schemes where you could raise a substantial amount of money much more than we can with the Article 6, I think. And the other thing which I've just uh, submit, made a submission about the, the quantified, uh, what a collective quantified goal on climate uh, finance, which proposes, in essence, that we should need the, 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 the act, disaggregate the whole thing and, and, and look also at the collective quantified goal on public sector adaptation grant finance. Okay. As opposed to, the, I mean, it might be more easier to, uh, to handle, and it's something which which developing countries are particularly keen on. I mean, it's it's absolutely clear, as we've been told, that the the balance between adaptation and, and mitigation finance is just ludicrous still. Okay, so these sort of things. But as I said, I mean, the 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 uh, the, the thing to do is is to we will. There's no doubt in my mind that the global goal on adaptation will be part of the priorities in, 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 in uh, COP27, because this actually came from Africa, from South Africa. Adaptation, L, uh, a loss and damage finance, because the, the, the people who, who will be in, at the forefront, the lead negotiators, they were actually the finance coordinators of the African group. So this, these things will be top priority, I can, I can guarantee you. And so there are submissions to be made, look it up on the UNFCCC website. They've actually just relaxed the conditions to actually to submit. You don't have to be a registered organization anymore. You can do it as an individual. Okay, so please think about doing that. This is very a very good way of of bringing things into the process. So, Nicola, briefly, what what are the other milestones for us to look out for in the UK's presidency or otherwise? Well, let me first come come back and clarify that when I say the real world, I don't mean the private sector. Um, I also mean uh, a large part of the public sector and the point that I made before about the fiscal side of this. So the public sector financing and actually even the public sector financing countries that are that have do have targets under the COP process. Um, are still not aligning their finance uh, with net zero targets, and, and our own research at Oxford shows that shows that very clearly. So, so, so I, that's not. I don't mean real world as the private sector, give, particularly given that I spent most of my life in the public sector. I definitely wouldn't say that. Um, on so on on milestones, and I'm going to focus on the adaptation ones because, I, and maybe you know, Cecile, you yourself would like to say about milestones. You want to see on nature, and maybe Miles will say something about milestones on on the mitigation side so on on adaptation to so the the global there is there are a number of processes official processes that were put in place um at cop 26 leading up to cop 27 one was was the specification of a global goal for adaptation and there was also a, a process related to loss and damage as well and, and both are really critical what i guess one thing that worries me is those those are two very very sticky issues and and you know a global goal for adaptation has been under discussion for a, a very very long time, and so I I don't raise personally my expectations too high that will turn up in in Sharm El Sheikh and both of those have been completely solved. But the fact that there is an official process now I think is is very important. I think in terms of milestones on on adaptation that that I would want to see so. One one would be the the commitments to financing. So there's always been this 
50-50 split between adaptation and mitigation that people talk about, but it's never been sort of made official. So if we can have an increasing number of both um, countries, but also multilateral partners that are, are really committing to that, I think that would be a really, really important milestone. Um, but also the to to I think we again we need to connect between the negotiations and what's happening on the ground. And one of the things that we heard um, in the last two days in the discussions on this topic was that the need for um, more evidence on on what's working, the sort of readiness of of countries, the the issues around project preparation and whether they're really issues. Um, I think so, some of those are the, some really critical things. That it's just about bringing bringing. Uh, all of that evidence that we have from the development community in particular into the climate negotiations. I would just make a final point about some, if I if I may, just on other things that are happening that could derail the process. And this comes back to the public finance side again. So public debt levels are astronomically high at the moment post COVID or in the stage that we are in COVID now. And that will impact both high income countries ability to make financial pledges, but in particular for the lower and middle income countries to act. And so I do think that another important part of this process this year needs to be to look at some viable ways to deal with that problem. And there's a lot of proposals on the table, you know, climate for debt swaps, etc. And I do think if, if we were going to look at some milestones, actually having some proper process in place to look at those is absolutely essential because these, you know, many countries will be experiencing the impacts of, of COVID on their, their public budgets for, for the next 10 years. And we can't let that derail progress. So briefly, I'd like to um, take that question to, to the rest of the panel and say, what are the factors that they see uh, potentially not just climate related factors, but external non-climate related factors, which might be really formative to, to what happens over the coming months in climate. Uh, we've seen, for instance, uh, deepening geopolitical tensions around the world, particularly between Russia and Europe and Ukraine. We've seen uh, Boris Johnson as UK Prime Minister, who's been a strong advocate of net zero, actually, particularly in the right wing of his party. His, his prime ministership seems to be hanging by a thread. We've seen uh, Joe Biden in the States struggling to get through climate legislation or any other legislation, to be honest, in, in the US federal system. Um, so those are other, other factors. What do people see as, as the big forces at play? Uh, Nicola touched on, on rising debt and the post-COVID recovery. Uh, does anyone else want to pick up on any other ones they see as the big factors, positive or negative? Miles, you're on mute. Do we go first, Cecile, or shall I? Uh, ahead, well, the, the first one that pops to mind would be the, the, the movement of the green recovery um, and just the, the enthusiasm, in, in our case, it would be positive, the enthusiasm towards um, ensuring that the post-COVID recovery uh, involves a lot of investment in nature and uh, the creation of jobs that comes from this and the all the evidence the, that supports um, more resilient communities around nature-based solutions. So I guess that, that would be a positive one. And um, in terms of how to address that, how to, how, what, what we're working on, um, it would really be to clarify on one hand uh, the need for looking at the multiple benefits of, of uh, restoration, protection and better management of working lands. And also to, to be clear on what the limits of um, ecosystem restoration, protection management in terms of achieving net zero are. That's what we're we're working on a lot. Thank you, Cecile. Miles. I mean, I think the biggest obstacle really is a continued unwillingness of of so many involved in the process to actually just frankly acknowledge what needs to be done. I mean, you know, I didn't hear anyone at COP twenty six um, coming out and laying out what it means to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming. Scientifically, we know exactly what it means. It means that any CO2 that continues to be generated by the use of fossil fuels by mid-century will have to be safely and permanently disposed of. 
you know, it got rid of on a time scale commensurate with the damage that is done by use of fossil fuels. So potentially thousands of years. So, you know, if, if one global leader or, or a CEO of a fossil fuel company or, you know, the, the, the leader of a big environmental NGO would come out and say, that's what net zero has to mean, I would have a lot more faith in this process. But nobody will. Academics say it till they're blue in the face. And people, when you when you buttonhole them in the corridor and point this out, like some sort of, you know, slightly, you know, embarrassing village yokel in Benito's village, you know, with, with one message only, um, then people say, yeah, 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 we know you're right. Yes, yes, we know that's true. But then they move on and they talk about something else. And, and that's what is, to me, the obstacle here we've got to overcome is this propensity we seem to have as humans just to complicate things and avoid confronting the brutal truth that we can't go on dump using the atmosphere as a landfill for carbon dioxide. We've got to start getting rid of it in a better way than dumping it into the atmosphere. And, you know, we, we you, know, you know, Steve, everybody on this call knows what that'll take, but the process doesn't seem able to acknowledge it. I mean, the word, okay, let me not be too negative here. I mean, you know, in the in the in the joint U.S. China um, in, in the joint U.S. China uh, declaration, you know, there was a mention of carbon dioxide removal. Which obviously, is going to be a big part of what it takes to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming. Uh, you know, interestingly, a lot of people were quite sort of ambivalent about whether that was a good thing or not. At least it's you know we've got some players starting to acknowledge the importance of it. Um, and, um, you know, th that's what worries me about this process. I think going forward to Sharm el Sheikh will be about adaptation. It's the Africa comp. You know, I think that's going to be and it'll be about nature. It won't be about this kind of thing. But looking forward to COP28, COP28 is going to be happening in the United Arab Emirates. If at a COP in the United Arab, Arab Emirates, we cannot get hydrocarbons on the agenda, then we have a problem. So let's start working on that now. In the final, uh, just under half hour we've got, I'd love to turn it to more of the questions we've got from the audience. And uh, we have plenty, so I'm uh, delighted to see that, but also sorry we won't get through all of them. Um, one of the questions very specifically I'd like to throw to you, Miles, because it links directly to, to this net zero point. Uh, we have a question, if I can just scroll down here. It was about the timescale of when we need to reach net zero in order to be consistent with one and a half degrees. Is it 2030 or 2050 or something else? Um, so you can work it out yourself pretty easily um, because uh, it's just like the braking time on a car. Um, if it's 1.5 seconds before you reach the stop sign, you've got three seconds to stop if you want to stop at the stop sign. If it's 15 years before we get to 1.5 degrees, then you've got 30 years to stop. So we've got basically 30 years to stop the warming if we want to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees. You can make it more complicated than that if you want. And many people love making it more complicated than that, but that's basically where we're at. So there you have it. But that's only true if you hit the brakes immediately. And of course, every year's delay that we're not reducing emissions shaves two years off the time remaining at which we have to reduce emissions to zero um, in order to, to net zero, uh, in order to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. So, you know, it's still around mid-century, the date at which we have to get global emissions to zero to stop global warming, to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, but it's coming towards us at the same rate that we're going towards it, as long as we're not reducing our emissions. And I'm afraid that just comes out of the basic physics of the way carbon dioxide affects climate. Now, um, another question from the audience is about, can, so these pledges have been made, they may not even be enough to, to get us to that end point, um, but how confident can we even be that those pledges will be achieved? So. The IPCC special report on one and a half degrees says we need to decrease emissions rapidly from now, be at a rough halving by 2030, net zero CO2 by around 2050. So how confident are you as panel members that these targets will really be achieved? I think there's quite often an assumption that, you know, these uh, 
countries never meet their commitments, so we can't even trust the pledges. Benito. Right. I mean, there has been research, I think, on how, how countries actually uh, achieve or keep to promises which they make multilaterally. And, they, you know, we don't have a multilateral police force by and large to go and force enforce it. But you would be surprised how, how many countries actually try as hard as they possibly can to achieve what they have pledged. It's not, it's not, I mean, otherwise they wouldn't make such a fuss of pledging stuff, okay? <laughs> they would just say anything, but it's a reputational risk. It's a multi, multi period game. And you don't want to be caught with, with actually being shown that you haven't actually achieved. So when they make these pledges, they, they honestly, in most cases, believe that they will achieve it. Whether they will or not, it's a different kettle of fish. But I mean, I, I, what I just wanted to come back to the process, I think we really have to differentiate between the multilateral negotiations as a process and the general response of the globe to climate change, okay? Different things, much different. I mean, what you had with the US and China is not nothing to do with the negotiations, okay? And, and that's what we need. We need political will of these countries and we need to convince these leaders that it's important to do things. They should talk about, I'm not sure what's going to happen in, 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 the, in the Gulf, 28, COP28, okay? I mean, because it's not, the, I don't think that the, the, the presidency then, the incoming presidency will be particularly pushing to put oil on the agenda. <laughs> Although, having said that, I mean, Miles, you have had a, a success, which I, I almost fell off my chair when I read it. Do you know that Exxon now has a net zero target? Uh, for scope one and two emissions only. So not for the whole, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 but still, I mean, just the idea was to me like, whoa. Net zero is definitely <laughs> the, the new kid on the block. Anyway. Um, so, uh, yes. and if I recall correctly, the, the main precedent we have in terms of national climate pledges is the Kyoto Protocol, uh, which was set several years ago. And if I understand correctly, those countries which had a binding target under the Kyoto Protocol did actually in aggregate achieve those targets. The issue was, of course, there were lots of countries which didn't have any binding targets for the very good reason that they were less responsible for the problem and their emissions shot up, which is why global emissions in aggregate went up. But at least for the Kyoto Protocol, it seems in aggregate those targets were achieved. But uh, Cecile, I saw your hand up and, and Nicola. Yeah, just you. quickly, um, I, I just wanted to say, and of course, Benito, what you mentioned before about common timeframes and the global stock take being uh, a mechanism that encourages countries to raise ambition and also to achieve this ambition uh, that, that just supports countries in continuing that. And um, Exxon, I think uh, they probably rely quite a lot on nature-based solutions to achieve their their targets. So um, that is one of the guiding principles of nature-based solutions is not an excuse for continued emissions, fossil fuel emissions. That's the first principle. Nicola. Thank you. Well, I want to make um, three points which are, are, are probably slightly more optimistic than I usually sound on, on this agenda. But um, so so one one is that I think in some ways targets are a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't set a target, then the real economy doesn't do anything because you need to set the right signals. I think once you have a target there, we do see those signals. And, and one of the key uh, transitions that we've seen um, particularly in the financial sector, is this recognition of transition risk. So a lot of particularly financial institutions now are extremely worried about transition risk. So this is, this is basically the risk that the portfolios of investments that they hold will significantly lose value. And there are a number of reasons to think that that's the case. Central banks are now starting to worry about this around the world. This is one reason we are in COP engaging with central banks. You know, there's there's a Mark Carney and many others saying you know this could be a, a big financial stability issue because you know potentially we have a, an asset bubble, we have potential stranded assets, and that's going to create a big transition risk. And that and that's where where this self fulfilling prophecy comes in. As soon as soon as those targets or, or even the the prospect 
of significant changes coming in the policy environment, the, the real economy will start seeing that as a real risk and they will start adapting uh, to that. And we are seeing that. The second point that, that I would like to make is um, around litigation. So that's another big thing that we're seeing outside of the COP process, which is really beginning to scare people. So we're seeing it. We're seeing an increase in uh, litigation. So there's been a lot of discussion over several years about litigation risks on the big emitters, um, but we're actually now seeing successful cases coming through against some of the biggest emitters. And and you know, from my discussions again with the financial sector, there's people are starting to worry. Hang on, look, we're holding these assets. We're investing in these companies. Um, are they going to go bust because they're they're you know, got potential massive uh, litigation risks on them? So so there's we're starting to see real shifts in people's attitudes. And you know you cut the money from these firms, and and you know they're they're going to start to act. And there's a lot of dialogue about how do we um, transition so sort of between financial institutions and and big business about you know how how can we begin to support this transition. And that comes to my final point, which I think was was one of the very strong things that the UK announced. Not again, not as part of the the formal. Um, COP process, but within its set of announcements. And this was moving towards mandatory disclosure of transition plans for financial institutions. Now, this is huge. So this is basically saying that, you know, those those big financial institutions that have made, made these big commitments to net zero targets, um, they are now going to have to show their wares. You know, how, how are they how are they going to achieve that? So it's a trend, it's a commitment to disclosure of transition plans, not transition plans for net zero. Um, but you know, if you're a big financial institution and you've committed to net zero, then you, you're going to have to 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 show that. And that's the process that we're actually um, involved in in supporting. So I think there are some really big things happening that that should drive change. So sticking on the theme of money. Um, there's transition risk, there's the money needed um, and the risks associated with pulling down emissions, scaling up removals, getting to net zero. Uh, there's also physical climate risk and the, and the transition needed to make us more well adapted and resilient to current and future climate. So one of the other questions we have is what is the correct split of money or perhaps resources more generally between adaptation on the one hand and mitigation on the other? I well, guess particularly. <laughs> I guess, Nicola, you mentioned that we don't really have a globally agreed target for adaptation at the moment. So perhaps that's a hard one uh, to answer, but uh, I'll throw that one to you first. Yeah, so so, so within within the, the formal text of the Glasgow Pact, it doesn't say 50-50, but a, a, lot of a lot of, for example, the multilateral development banks have committed to 50-50, and actually the World Bank has, um, uh, says that it's already achieved 50-50. Uh, so, so it is, but, but I guess the the question is, well, it, it depends who you are. So, you know, if you're a company that is very exposed to physical risks and actually you're not a big emitter, then probably you should be putting all your money into adaptation finance. If you're a big emitter that's not very exposed, then you should be putting all your money into uh, the transition. But so I think it very much depends on 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 who we're talking about. But certainly at a big global level, um, the the fifty fifty is, is the sort of what people talk about. Uh, Benito, yes. If I can unmute myself, there we go. Actually, it's it's not well known anymore that the hundred billion figure was originally. Every people think it was Hillary Clinton in Copenhagen, but she picked it up from Gordon Brown, who six months beforehand actually announced it, and it was a public sector target, public sector finance only, and most of it was meant to go to adaptation. So you can just see that we have had uh, an idea from a, from a developed country, in a large country, that we should have a, uh, an adaptation target on its own in terms of the sort of, and I, as I said, I've, I've just uh, put that into the, the ring again in a submission that let's, let's talk about this because I think otherwise I have given up talking about the pathway to 100, because it's just everyone, it's just it really, no one agrees of how to count these hundred billions. And if we don't do that, it's not worth talking about, to be honest. It's like talking about hundred billion without mentioning whether it's yen or, or whatever, okay? <laughs> so, but to have to, to have a, a target, a sub-target for adaptation, I think would be a very 
salutary business and we could then start from there basically a question for you next cecile um 1.7 billion dollars uh was pledged at cop 26 um specifically for indigenous peoples according to sue cunningham she says they're guardians of 80 percent of global biodiversity but of course a much smaller fraction of land area so how do we make sure that that funding uh, goes to them in the right way, uh, doesn't end up with um, intermediaries, um, and that those local communities actually have the capacity to deal with this support and, and use it in the best possible way? Yeah, that, that's right. And there was a, so in COP, there was a strong recognition of the role of indigenous peoples and local communities in protecting nature and in, in, in all other aspects of, of what we're talking about. Um, I think everyone felt it. It was just uh, amazing to have so much involvement from, from uh, indigenous peoples and local communities. I think that question goes for all the money that was pledged. Um, how do we ensure there's direct access from the people who need it to the to the funding that's being pledged? And um, uh, it's a tough one. I think Benito would would say probably the um, adaptation fund is a good mechanism for this. Uh, yeah, Benito is probably a better place to, to answer this, but um, it does apply to, to all the funding and in particular to the communities. Uh, what we do say uh, when we're talking about nature-based solutions is the, always highlighting the need to involve local communities uh, from the design stage to, um, to make sure there's involvement at every stage and that um, uh, the stewardship of local communities just absolutely key to all these projects. Can I just, well, basically what we haven't figured out yet properly, even within country, is how to get small amounts of money to the local level, okay? Uh, and, and this is in, in many countries, you know, the industry, they're, they're not poor countries because they have large industries, okay? The, the economy is, is in the real world there. It comp comprises of very small activities. SMEs, local communities and things. And that, that's, I mean, one of the uh, things which we tried to do is to, we developed here in Oxford actually was, was the enhanced direct access, which, which the GCF has, the adaptation fund has, where the, the funding decisions, it's a sort of programmatic approach. The funding decisions are devolved to the lowest possible level, which means basically villages can decide, you know, you, you, you have within a certain parameters, you say, here is so much, use it to the best of your capacity. And in, in terms of adaptation, which to me is civil protection, it's always a difficult question of to decide, okay, we will protect you from this, but not from that. And the people who are at risk should be able to, to have a say in these decisions, particularly of what they are not going to be protected from. <laughs> Which is why this sort of thing. So, but this is still it's still the case, and also getting mitigation money to SMEs, right? Is not it's, it's 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 not not there yet. And this is one thing which I'm also working on of getting these 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 programs going that we can actually have them at large programs with micro activities. Nicola, did you want to come back on, on that question briefly um, as well before we move on? I know you touched earlier on, on the challenge of you know, announcing funding, but then make, making sure that it, it actually works well. And you were suggesting that perhaps institutions outside the UN climate process might be doing a better job of that than the, U, the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change Institutions themselves. Well, I think that... There's, there's so many issues involved in, in getting finance from a big global fund down to a local community. And, uh, and you know, we could talk for hours just about that. But I think coming back to a point that Cecile made, building on that is, I think a key thing is, one, that local communities need to have, be able to have a voice in, in how money um, is allocated at the moment. You know, there are processes there, but it's a long way from you know, an Indigenous local community to the board of the GCF. So how do, how do we get that dialogue better? But the other, but this role of intermediary, so as, you know, as a former development professional myself, 
you know, seeing the development system and the scraping off of, you know, layers of money as it goes through different financial intermediaries and, you know, the big, we were just, you know, talking this week about, you know, capacity building is often, you know, a big consultancy firm going in and having a meeting and it's tick box and there's a, you know, a big bill for, for holding a, a meeting with one of the, the big four consultancy firms. That's not, that's not what we need. So I think there there are just some really there's some basic things that, that that we need, particularly to sort of draw from expertise in the development community about how to do this well. But we also, you know, coming back to the, the SME finance point, you know, there are existing delivery channels for these types of finance and we should be using those. So, you know, there there are there's a, a financial system um cooperatives, smaller local banks and others that are that do that. So we should be working with them. So I think it's about, you know, rethinking our approach in some cases. Um, in the nine minutes we have left, I'm going to do my best to get through three more questions. So uh, panel, work with me and be as brief as possible. And I very much appreciate that. Um, I'm actually going to try tying a couple of questions together, uh, mainly for you, Benito. There's a question about the role of the US. Um, and how cru how crucial is domestic politics, particularly the um, Biden's climate legislation at the moment, to uh, achieving our climate targets? But also, um, ha how should the UN process, the multilateral process, engage nations which which uh, don't bother to participate seriously? Is how one person one questioner has put it. But certainly, there's been you know varying levels of engagement uh, from the US in particular in in the UN process. Well, let me put it this way. When Trump came in, that wasn't helpful. It wasn't. <laughs> but there's nothing much you can do from outside. Okay. What, what, what one can do is to try to help those, those forces within the country who are progressive is to be, give them a voice, help them to, but I mean, to think that we can actually sort of uh, force countries to do stuff. In my mind, it's 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 very dangerous to go down that route. Okay, so so it's it's more to to basically make make people see, make countries see that it's in their own benefit to do this stuff, and it is. I mean, let's face it. Overall, everyone with with a sort of half a brain cell will realize that a not not a single country, or how matter how big, can solve this on their own. So it is a collective action problem. And it is a problem for everyone. And, and I mean, for example, one thing which, which I find quite uh, interesting, the way in which China has changed its sort of attitudes toward the whole thing. They really have taken on a leadership role now. It's, I mean, some people may say not enough and whatever. But when they started, they all said, we didn't create this. This is your problem. You deal with it. And now they realize that, that you know, it, it's very much their problem. And if, if we don't collaborate, then it's not going to happen. Miles, do come in and then I want to ask you a question straight afterwards. I just wanted to come up on that. We can't force countries to do anything. We can force companies to do things. If those companies are engaged in international trade and operating in multiple jurisdictions. And I, I think that's why, again, I keep coming back to the fact that we seem to be asking the wrong questions here. We're worrying about helping small and medium sized enterprises. There's fewer than 80 very, very large enterprises that basically could solve this problem if they had the incentive to do so, but they don't. So this is, that's a beautiful segue into what I want to ask you because a couple of people in the audience have been asking about the role of fossil fuel companies actually in, in the negotiations and the COPs themselves. Um, there's the question of why so many of them were there. They certainly were. I noticed uh, at least one banner saying, uh, claiming that fossil fuels were the answer to all the sustainable development goals, uh, which was my most popular tweet during my time at the COP. Um, there's no irony lost there, of course. Um, <laughs> but it, it was very interesting. Uh, well, one question I might put to you is, is, would it be better if the fossil fuel companies were more or less engaged in this process? It was very notable, for instance, that you said in getting to net zero, what we need is to stop fossil fuels from adding to global warming. It wasn't stop fossil fuels, full stop. So what's your view on the role of fossil fuel companies in this and whether they should or shouldn't be there? Well, I, I think having a conference without a conference about climate change without fossil fuel companies would be like having a conference on, on fertilizer use without farmers. I mean, you, you, you 
obviously you need to be dealing with the the people who are overwhelmingly selling the product that's causing the problem. Um, so, um, but I mean, the difficulty is the fossil fuel companies are probably less well represented than the than people who feel they're speaking for the fossil fuel industry or lobbyists and so on around them. And, and that's where it all starts to get very messy. And so I think the, 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 the uh, you know, I don't think the contribution of the fossil fuel industry to the COP process has been madly helpful so far. Um, but in some ways, I, I, um, I think that reflects the process as much as it reflects it's a criticism of the companies. Um, you know, I, I don't think the process has been about them and it's been made far too easy um, for them to change the subject and have it become about something they're more comfortable talking about than the very simple question of how we stop fossil fuels from causing global warming. Does anyone else briefly have, have a view, perhaps a slightly different take or, or the same take on whether the fossil fuel companies are there in, in, in too much force or they're lobbyists, uh, whether it would be a good or a bad thing for them not to be there? Well, the, 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 the analogue, I think, would be if you have a sort of a conference which is the, uh, discussing measures to, to uh, get rid of smoking and then do we have tobacco companies there, okay? So, so uh, it has happened. There, there's a whole convention on, on that stuff, I think. And they, they, as far as I understand, these tobacco companies are not allowed to be to be observers. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a philosophical. It is a philosophical question, but of course, you know, you're not asking the tobacco company. I mean, maybe we should, but we aren't in the way we're approaching. Um, the, 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 the smoking problem, we, we don't ask the tobacco companies to fix their product, we, we ask smokers to fix their habit. Um, now, you know, I think the fossil fuel industry would probably be delighted for us to take the same approach with the fossil fuel industry um, as we've taken with tobacco, which is to focus on the smokers and to say, you know, it's a public health issue, you've got to fix the habit. So to focus on the consumer and say, you've got to stop using fossil fuels. And Meanwhile, the fossil fuel industry is allowed to carry on selling it as long as there's a market out there. You know, that's not the conversation we should be having. Um, they should be cleaning up after themselves. It's, it's a really simple proposition, which unfortunately is just way back, I don't know, in 1992, we started thinking about this problem as essentially a problem of emissions. And the fact of the matter is that the main beneficiary of burning fossil fuels is the person who owns the fuel as it comes out of the ground. They're the ones who make the money. The, the poor old consumer at the far end of the chain, they're barely able to afford the petrol they're putting in their car. So, you know, we're just focusing at the wrong point of the system. That's a topic that I think uh, we should persuade the Martin School to have a whole separate discussion on, because I think it's a fascinating and rich one. We're probably not going to tie up here. I want to- uh, We have some fossil fuel companies. <laughs> Or and let's invite them. Um, I want to um, take as the final question the one which was actually voted the most popular, which gets to this uh, issue of the, the individual versus the corporate. So um, how, how can we encourage individuals to, to contribute? How can individual behaviour change be encouraged? Is it actually a question of individual behaviour change or is it only something that's going to come through the top down government legislation? Um, I'd love to give you each... Uh, a chance to ask that very quickly and, and, and maybe give any final thoughts, but it's got to be super quick. So I'm going to pick on one of you to go first. Let's do this in the order that you all spoke. So Nicola, why don't you take that one first? Well, I'd say it has, it has to be both, obviously, um, but, and, you know, we all bear significant um, individual responsibility for where we are right now um, in terms of our own behavior. But it, so it has to be both. But again, I think we are seeing very positive movements in changes in individuals' behavior. I saw there were some comments around circular economy and the importance of that. So we, you know, we are seeing positive things, but you know, we, we do, yeah, we all bear a responsibility in, in every part of this, the public sector, individuals, the private sector needs to be, to be working together on this. Benito. We actually have a little website together with the ECI, which is called coolforclimate.org, where we showcase campaigns, which are basically showing that sustainable lifestyle behavior is cool and not being sustainable is not cool. And we are, we are not using this enough. 
I mean, we're, we're just relying on, on the stick, the taxes, and not that we don't need taxes and regulations and stuff, but I tell you, the moment the politician realizes that the voter wants this, he will be much more, he and she will be much more willing to risk to put out the neck, right? Same for the, for the, for the in industry. They will produce the stuff the consumer wants. So it, it goes both ways. And I think we should, we should also do this. Image. Cecile. Uh, yeah, of course, I, I agree with Nicola and Benito about this, both, all. And um, I'd, I'd just add that as the consumer or as the, um, the civil society scrutiny is increasing, we just need to make sure we have the mechanisms in place to, to make the decisions they're making more informed and have more transparency in what they're consuming and more clarity on exactly where they're having most, most impact. And um, wow. yeah, that's about it. <laughs> I think everything else has been said. So what can you do as a consumer? Uh, well, you could write to your fossil fuel supplier and ask them why they're spending the windfall profits they're getting from current fossil fuel prices um, are giving money back to their shareholders rather than spending at least some of it on stopping the carbon dioxide generated by their activities and products from causing global warming. They've got the technology to do it. They know how to do it. They could have it done within 30 years and stop climate change, but they have no incentive to try. Thank you all very much. We have to leave it there. Um, I'd like to thank once again our panelists, uh, Nicola Ranger, Benito Muller, Cecile Girardin and Mars Allen for such great insights. I hope that's given you all fresh insight and enthusiasm to keep running the climate race, which is, let's face it, a marathon and a sprint at the same time. Um, you can find out more and register on the Oxford Martin website for the next installments in this series of conversations. This time next week, we'll have Professor Dieter Helm asking the question, what would a sustainable economy look like? Um, in the meantime, I hope you all have a very good week. So goodbye. <laughs>